CRS Center for Remembering and Sharing. I'm Yasko. Happy New Year. Year. So this John Mandy's uh, Miracles in Manhattan series started uh, May 2013. So meaning this is the seventh New Year we meet together. So who is the uh, seventh year's student here? Wow, yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, Billy, hi. Mike, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, great, great, great. And who is the uh, new first time? Oh, new friends here. Welcome to our class. Thank you. So I myself uh, so often, you know, out of town, and you guys sometimes out of town and can't come, but uh, we continue. So this, you know, learning is a uh, lifetime learning. So let's continue. So uh, John always said that, uh, that this world is our classroom. And this classroom, this particular classroom here, is to see the world as classroom. <laughs> we remember that. So whatever happened to you, it's a class material. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So each material might be different, but uh, actually same thing, right? And uh, we just um, uh, see the. Uh, uh, salvation the same way, and uh, we reach the same place. So let's do it together again today, OK? Yeah. So John, welcome. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, honey. This is the only uh, Course in Miracles Space Center in New York City. Um, in fact, there are not very many of them in the world. <laughs> San Francisco and a few other places, but uh, not a lot. Uh, Paul and I were just talking a moment ago about, as we all know, the churches are disappearing, so what's replacing the churches? And But they're still like-minded. One thing is AA, is, which has been around for many, many years, decades, but it's a spiritual group. You know, It's a spiritual-centered way of approaching things that doesn't use the word church. You know, we don't use the word church either, but we're like-minded people to come together to study the same spiritual concepts. And as we all know, uh, there's really nothing like the Course in Miracles. Uh, by saying there's nothing like the Course in Miracles, I mean, there's, there are more and more things now. We have a Course of Love. Uh, we've got The Way of Mastery. We've got other Gina Likes books, et cetera, things like that coming out. But what I meant was, going back, first of all, the, the course is, it's now 45 years. That's just really re re incredible. Uh, we started working with a manuscript in, in 1975. There was a small group of us here in the city, and it was published in 76. Uh, Judy Scotch Whitson, who was really the one who was a publisher of the course, Judy and I have been friends pre-course. Uh, did a little webinar thing on Thursday evening, and we were <coughs> reflecting on the fact that it had been 45 years. And also Jerry Jampolsky was on this, this webinar, and Jerry's now 95 years old, and Judy will be 89 in May, and I'm not even going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> but this I will tell you. In May, uh, when we have the class, we're going to, I'm have, David Fishman is going to come back and be with us. And David will be 80 in May, right? So it's also my birthday uh, in May. So we'll, we'll kind of, and speaking of birthdays, you hope you don't mind if I mention the fact 
that's sitting in the corner back here, kind of hiding, and you could stand up so we could see you. Uh, Courtney is going to be 40 years old on, was it Wednesday? 40. That's right. huh? Huh? And I also have to know that Eric, where's Eric? Eric, uh, hey, there, just turned 70 recently, so. Uh, yeah. And Al just turned 80 uh, recently, so. <clears throat> A bunch of old people. <laughs> it takes a while to get the course. <laughs> it takes a lot of, lot of, lot of in-depth uh, work. But if you're here, you're here in part because you know it's worth it and because you know that it, it really does work. So I just want to do a few announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, with regard to today, uh, Topic-wise, I really have three topics that really kind of fit together. And also, we may sort of break these up a little bit. By that I mean, uh, it seems like folks, uh, it's harder for them to watch an hour plus uh, video, but if we do like three, 35 minutes or something like that, and we'll, we'll break. And I think it's kind of going to divide itself naturally into that. Our general topic is I am responsible for what I see. We'll talk about why that is true in, in a minute. Uh, but first of all, the latest issue of Miracles Magazine is out. If you're watching this on YouTube, we publish a magazine called Miracles. We've been doing so. That's for 34 years. It'll be 35 years this year. And uh, one of the ways that you could help to support us a little bit would be to subscribe to Miracles Magazine. And there's two ways you can do it. You can either do it uh, by electronically, or you can get the actual magazines, a physical magazine in the mail. That would be a nice way for you to help us. Um, also, I want to let everybody know, especially the folks that are watching, I have a Tuesday evening Course in Miracles class now as well, which you can join. You can join anytime. Even though we do sub, we're doing uh, six weeks, then we take a break, six weeks, and take a break. That's the general process that we've been using. And right now we're working on chapter 21, uh, section 2, which is called the responsibility for sight. Each of you should have got a little piece of paper when you came in, right? And on that is a three-sentence quote from A Course in Miracles. We're going to go over that in some detail. And what I'm suggesting is that you actually memorize that. Okay, that's why I gave it to you on a little piece of paper. Memorize it so that when you're sitting on the subway, you can recall it. When you're doing whatever you're doing, especially it's a good thing to recall when you're feeling a little stressed. And you'd be surprised that that's an important thing to, to look at when you're feeling a little stressed. But it is a little important thing to, to look at, accept that responsibility. Uh, also, for those of you who are watching this, if you're watching it prior to uh, March of uh, 2020, I'm doing an eight-city tour of Florida the last week of March. And go to our website, miraclesmagazine.org, which should be at the bottom of your screen, and uh, you can see where what the location is. Uh, also, there's a conference based on the Course of Miracles coming up in Los Angeles over a Memorial Day weekend. That's also on our website. We also have reduced rate tickets if you go to that website. And in July, I'm going to be doing a week-long presentation uh, at a college in Michigan. So you can find out about that on our website as well. So, um, so let's talk about the three topics that I want to talk about. Uh, number one uh, could be, I realize, uh, Paul and I were talking in the car coming down, uh, could be a little controversial. I don't want it to be that way. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about the current political situation that we find ourselves in as this country. Now, when I say to talk about the current political situation, I don't mean that we are talking about people. I don't mean that we are talking about personalities. I don't mean that we're talking about right and wrong. What I mean is just understanding in greater depth, if we can, the general psychological nature of human consciousness and how it is that we get ourselves into such trouble 
with all of our attack on one hand and defensiveness on the other hand, and what Jesus has to say about this, <clears throat> and when I say Jesus, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, both the Jesus of historical, the, the, of the New Testament, that Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, and also with the Course in Miracles, that Jesus, which is the same Jesus, but uh, one from 2,000 years ago and one for understanding today. It's the same message, really. <coughs> So we'll do that to start. Uh, that takes up to about slide 12, I think, or 13. And that probably will take us about a half hour. And then we'll break and come back. And then we'll go to our next topic, which is this part about I am responsible for what I see. Okay? And also uh, remind you if we could just sort of hold off on dialoguing or questions and answers until I've got like 20 minutes worth of presentation done. And then after that, we can, we'll open the floor for, for dialoguing. Okay, so um, I am responsible for what I see. This line is the, a section, it's on page 448. If you have the Foundation for Inner Peace edition of A Course in Miracles, chapter 21, section 2, which I think is really one of the most important sections. It's not that it, all the sections aren't important, but this is something if you take it to heart, that's why I gave you these little slips of paper to memorize, right? If you take it to heart, it really will help to change your life completely, right? So it says, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. Now, what it means to say that the sole responsibility of miracle is, is to clean up the ego thing. <laughs> now, what I mean by cleaning up the ego thing and this is a very interesting part of the course because it's really understanding that there is no ego, that the whole thing does not exist. <clears throat> it looks so much like it does, but this is a great mythology. It's actually freeing ourselves from a mythology. So if I hear something, someone say something like, we have to kill the ego, I think, no, 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 no. You know, there's nothing to kill. <laughs> I mean, the whole idea that you're going to kill something means that there's something really out there to kill, right? But there's nothing to kill. All we have to do is just to realize that this thing isn't real to start with. It's that simple, right? It doesn't even exist. That's why one of the reasons that the Course seems very difficult for people to try to, this is a, an incredible leap to make in consciousness to realize that we're fighting uh, against something that's not real. It's like the, the, the devil, you know? It's like, there's no devil. There's no adversary. There's nobody out there. The only adversary is the adversary that's in our own minds, which is, if you will, keeping us from awakening. That seems to be blocking our awareness because we think that there's something out there, right? something external to our own minds. I was working with someone who was paranoid at one point, and um, I was realizing that the paranoia had nothing to do with, any, that there's no one out there, paranoid person, they're, they're, people are following me, they're, they're listening in on my phone, whatever it is. And I thought, no, that's not, there's nobody listening in on your phone, there's nobody talking to you on the television. You know, that's a total mythology, right? But you've got to be able to see that. If you can't understand that there is no ego, it's, there's a wonderful line in the Course in Miracles that says, enlightenment, enlightenment, right? Enlightenment is simply a recognition. It's not a change at all. Think about it. Enlightenment is simply a, a recognition of bringing back into the mind an awareness of something which has always existed. What has always existed? You have always existed as a spiritual being. You can't help but exist as a spiritual being, but we fall into this belief that somehow or another, no, I've got an ego, you know, and I've got to deal with this ego, I've got to fight against this ego, I've got to get rid of the ego. There's no ego to get rid of. It's like waking up in the morning and you realize, oh, what a, a silly, I had a, the silliest dream 
Yeah, I, I, I dreamed that uh, some, I had a, a sincerely dream about my wife this morning. <laughs> I woke the, no, I'm not going to tell her about that. It was just too simple. I'm too silly, rather, <laughs> to talk about even. Right? All right, so let's start looking at some of the lines from the course. And again, so the course, I mean, this is just emphasizing what was either God or the ego is insane. Okay. And this is exactly what I'm saying. The Course in America is very, say very clearly that this is an insane world. Now that seems interesting because you look around and, and it does look like an insane world, but actually if you want to take it deeper, there is no world either. I, don't, I couldn't explain that. What, what it means when it says that is that there, there's nothing outside of you. There's nothing outside of your mind. That's one of my favorite lines from the Course as well. Just a, I love little short sentences. There is nothing outside of you. There's nothing outside of the way you see. So what is, let's assume that you weren't here. By assuming you weren't here, I mean let's assume that you, your body has passed away and has been cremated and there's absolutely none of it. It doesn't exist at all. You are not here. You are not in space time. You are not on planet Earth, right? But there still is a consciousness. There is still an awareness. There is still a spirit. But where is then? Then where is planet Earth? <laughs> where is planet Earth if you can't see it? If you have no relationship to it, would it not then seem like a dream that happened once upon a time in a land far, far away? There was a guy named Michael, and he had some sort of experiences or whatever it was, but even that, wouldn't even, even just like when you wake up in the morning, wouldn't that even disappear pretty quickly? So that's why this whole thing is an illusion. We're really awakening to the realization, but we take it so very, very seriously. It looks so, and especially when we get into a situation like we're in at the moment, where there seems to be a great deal of conflict that's going on within the world, and we are against each other. And one of the things that I'd like to convey is we are not against each other. There is no war. There is no other. There's no one that needs to be attacked. There's no bad guy. Right? That's a really important point to understand. There's nothing external to you. And we're going to have some quotes from Jesus here in a few minutes that's really going to emphasize this. So the next uh, quote is probably one you know very familiar with. I've used it here, I'm sure, two or three or four or a dozen times before. This is the opening paragraph from chapter 21. So, but it emphasizes what I was just saying. So I will share this with you. Projection makes perception. Just those three words, nothing more than that. Projection makes perception. That a sentence appears twice in the Course. It's also in chapter 18. Projection makes perceptions. The world you see is what you gave it. What you are giving it right now. It never stops. Nothing more than that. Let's underline the word nothing. It is nothing more than that. But though it's not more than that, it's not less. Therefore, to you it's important. It's a witness to your state of mind. It's an outside picture of an inner condition. So we are constantly projecting the world. And I understand you're projecting the whole thing. You say, well, I'm not responsible for what's going on in another country. Well, you are. You're, you're responsible for your interpretation of it. You're responsible for the way you see it. You're responsible for your reaction to it. You're, you're responsible for saying, these are bad guys, and these are good guys, and this is stupid, and this is... And, and, and we're sane, and, and it's okay to kill people, and it's whatever it is that your position is. Positioning yourself is the problem. There's a sense of which the, the Course is really asking us to be able to get above the battlefield, literally get above the battlefield. You look down, you see the game, you see the play, and you make this very, very simple decision, and that is, I am not playing. I am not getting opinionated about this. I am not projecting about this. I have, I, I, I see it. I mean, it, it's, it, you can't help but see it. This is what's happening. This is what's going on within the context of the illusion. Just like if you're having a bad dream, 
<laughs> it's what's happening within the context of the bad dream. But it doesn't mean the bad dream is real, because again, it's a dream, right? As a man thinketh, so does he perceive. You've heard probably heard me say that line is from Proverbs. Jesus quotes it in the Gospels, except in the Gospels, he says, as a man believeth, so is he. But that's exactly the same thing. As a man thinketh, so does he perceive. As he believeth, so is he. Right? Therefore, and this is a really one of the most important lines in the Course in terms of the, it's probably one of the most quoted lines in the whole Course. Therefore, seek not to change the world. Very important. It's not out there. Seek not to change the world, choose to change your mind about the world. All right, so projection is a, a result and not a cause. So it's, it's, it just means understanding that there's nothing that I have to do or I have to fix except within my own mind. And that is a matter of a choice. That is a matter of a decision about how I choose. So how would Jesus see what's going on right now? Jesus would continue to be Jesus, which means that you bless whatever it is. You love whatever it is that's going on. You never, there's, there's not like that there's somebody out there to attack, right? Now, this is the insane uh, quote. This is an insane world. Do not underestimate the extent of its insanity. There's no area of your perception that is not touched. And your dream is sacred to you. That's why God placed the Holy Spirit in you, where you placed the dream. So this is not a real world. Heaven's our home. It's the, it's the only eternal reality that there is. And the part of that, a lot of this has to do with time. Because we live in space-time. And the space-time itself is the illusion. Right? But it, it, I mean, it is such a good illusion. I mean, it, it's so real. It's like a, with a magician, you can't see the trick. <laughs> it's really a trick, but you can't see that it's a trick because we're playing the trick on ourselves, right? So let's go on. Uh, one evening I was watching America's uh, Funniest Videos, and it just showed a little boy who's sitting in the back seat of the car, and he's playing with a video game, right? And he, he stops playing with his video game, and he looks up, and he looks out the window, and he says with this matter of fact, sort of like, is this a real world? <laughs> you see, he was just lost in the video game world, right? So that was the world that he was in, and now he's looking out the car window, watching trees and grass and stuff passing him by, but he's so caught in that world that, uh, well, is this a real world? I mean, you know, we could ask ourselves that question. And the Course of Miracles is saying, no, you know, heaven is reality. Heaven is the, what's eternal, you know. It doesn't mean that this world is hell. It just means that this world is a, well, for some people, sometimes it feels like hell. I mean, it just feels like a, a place that you're, you're, you're stuck. And by the way, I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later, but one of the problems of doing A Course in Miracles is, this is both good and bad, one of the problems of doing it is that as you begin to wake up, you realize that you are waking up. And you begin to see the two worlds, if you will, right? And in that case, you, you know that it's not a real world, but you're not qu quite sure what to do about it. And you can't change it, or you can't fix it. I mean, you can't change or fix the outside world, right? So the only thing you can do is, is fix your perspective that you have on the thing, which is what the Course in Miracles is trying to help us to do. But you can't go back to sleep. You know how it is when you wake up in the morning, and you're laying there in bed, and you're not yet quite a, you, you, you don't have the covers off yet. You're still... You're in that kind of in-between world, and it's like you're starting to think about what's your respon you know, responsibility. Oh, I got those bills to pay today, and oh my God, I got to call the doctor, and oh, and there's just so many, and, and oh God, I've got to, oh God, I don't want to get up. I don't want to do this. I Put your feet on the floor. <laughs> Put your feet on the floor. You know, it's like, 
<clears throat> at some point you got to do it. You got to get up and deal with it. You know, there's there's no running away from this. I mean, there's no running away from this. When I'm by this, I mean the body, right? I mean, you've got a body, right? The body's not real either. <laughs> that's something else of the Course. And that is probably, as you know, that's the most frequently quoted line, not quoted, but used line in the Course. I am not a body. I am free. For I am still as God created me. What, and then, fortunately, we also have the affirmation, I am spirit. Thank God I am spirit. I am not a body, but I am spirit. But in the meantime, you know, uh, there's a good chance that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, Al and I may not be here. <laughs> it's like tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, it's as coming as this down, down the road. It's not very far away. Shanti, well, the Shanti would be uh, 123 years old. I don't think that that's... Uh, <laughs> She will be 93 come uh, April 1st, right? Like I said, we're all getting older, right? Yeah, well, so, uh huh? What's an age? What's an age? What the heck is? Right. Yeah, let's be the same situation. Let's go on. So, what is the real world? The real world, <laughs> therefore, the Course meant, is a state of mind in which the world of perception is released, the world of judgment is released. There'll be another way to say it from the projections of guilt we have placed upon it. <clears throat> and we pl place projections of guilt. I mean, you are guilty. You screwed up. You've messed up. You are a bad guy. You need to be fixed, right? Not me. I'm cool. I'm good. I understand. And I have the right to kill you. <laughs> 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 oh, that makes me a bad guy, doesn't it? Oh, well, Lord. <laughs> well, you understand the, the problem and the paradox. So guilt is the feeling we have in relationship to sin. So sin is the belief and the reality of the fact that we have somehow or another separated from God. That I, I did something against God in the past. And it's, it's, it's easy for that, that, that guilt to come, come running in there. There's a, there's a story of a, of a woman who goes to see her hypnotherapist. And she comes bursting into his office and she says, oh my God, oh my God, I've, I've been married for 15 years. I've never been unfaithful to my husband. I love him, but yesterday, yesterday I had an affair and the guilt, oh my God, the guilt, the guilt is, you, you gotta help me. And the, psych, the hypnotherapist says, oh, not again. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> not again. We just keep, you know, I'll clear it up. We'll clear it up. We'll, we'll, we'll help you forget it. Uh, but if you keep doing it, it'll be back. you'll be back in here again. Okay? All right. So let's go on. So we are looking <clears throat> to change our minds about the world, not to change the world. Now, how much it may appear as though the problem is in the world. That's not to say there are not problems in the world. There are obviously problems in the world, right? And there always have been, and there always will be. That's the nature of this world that we're a part of. In fact, is a study of history is not a fun thing. It's really a study of wars. And do you know that actually, in a lot of ways, things are they really are much better than ever? Go on the internet and look at. It's a very interesting. Murder has gone way down. Now it looks like there's a lot because you see it on television. Right, but you know, if somebody gets murdered in Texas and it makes big news for the whole world, well, people were being married, murdered all over the country back when there was no radio. <laughs> you know, all there was was the local newspaper. But actually, if you go back, historically speaking, to the 13th, the 14th, the 15th centuries, along in there, there was a lot more murders going on, which didn't get reported right? because there wasn't it wasn't the same. We didn't have media. <laughs> We didn't have a way to, to know about that. People actually got, got by with it, sometimes uh, very overtly. So if I'm not having peace of mind, I can only find it by aligning my mind with the mind, which is what the Course is asking us to do. That's why, how many of you started doing the workbook lessons? Uh, oh, how nice. Like practically half the room, raise your hands, that's very nice. 
you got to do it. I mean, you got to hang in there with it and, and willingly do it over and over again. And you just, the more you do it, the more you find it gets deeper and you start seeing it. It becomes clearer and clearer and clearer to you. So <clears throat> the ego is insane. <clears throat> in fear, it stands beyond the everywhere, apart from all, and separation from the infinite. The fact that it's insane also means it doesn't exist, right? Because there's no such thing as insanity in heaven, all right? So that couldn't exist. We live in the everywhere, the all, and the infinite. That's where we really live. That's our home, right? Spirit is eternal and has never changed. It cannot change because it's not a part of change. One of the characteristics of this world is change, right? And because change is something which happens in time. I realize that this is taking a, big of a, a bit of a leap in consciousness because it's asking us to remember eternity or infinity, which is a place of, of permanence. It's not a place where that good and bad things can occur, right? Where there are differences, right? The weather doesn't change. <laughs> okay, so this is now from... Uh, uh, Jesus talking in the, in the Course. One of the things we're trying to do is to realize the Course says very clearly that there's only one of us here. And that may be seen, that seems to have so many different manifestations. But there's only one mind. There's only one presence. It seems to have all these little, but there's no difference. That when, there's no difference. The whole problem is, is understanding there's no difference between us. Not as spirit, we may have different bodies in space-time. We have different complexions and backgrounds and all that stuff, but that's something that's happening in history and in time. It's not something that's happening in eternity. So Jesus, for example, speaking about Judas, Judas is often portrayed in traditional Christianity as a bad guy, right? He did this awful thing. He he saw to it that Jesus got uh, crucified. Actually, in the, in the story, Jesus is a very important character. Uh, what did I say? Judas. Jesus, Judas, Judas. Judas is a very important character because uh, without Judas, uh, we don't have the crucifixion. And without the crucifixion, we don't have Christianity. It's actually without the resurrection, we don't have, to have, we don't have Christianity. But uh, obviously the crucifixion has to precede the resurrection, right? And what Jesus is doing on the cross, by the way, and this is where the Course of Miracles is different than traditional Christianity. It's really important to understand this. He's not suffering, dying, and bleeding for your sins. What he's doing there is showing you there is no such thing as death, right? As the last line of Martin Luther's hymn, The uh, Mighty Fortress says, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Right? They're, they're, it doesn't matter about the body. All bodies are going to be disappear, be wiped out. But the truth remains, the spirit remains. So Jesus in the Course of America says, Judas was my brother, and the Son of God, as much a part of the sonship as myself. Was it likely that I would condemn him when I was ready to demonstrate that condemnation is impossible. It's impossible because that's not, you can't condemn the eternal. You can't condemn God. I mean, how, you think God's going to respond to that? How could you do that? You, you have that kind of power to actually, that's the problem of the ego is the ego is something which tries to stand up against God. And there's nothing, you can't stand up against love. You can't stand up against the infinite because you just disappear in its presence. All right? So, of course, America says the strong do not attack because they see no need to do so. Before the idea of attack can ever enter your mind, you must perceive yourself as weak. That's interesting, right? Before you can attack, you must perceive yourself as weak and therefore needing somehow or another to attack. The stronger you are, the less need you have to attack. Love does not kill to save. 
If it did, attack would be salvation. This is the ego's interpretation, not God's. Only if love is strong because it is undivided. And now this is Jesus in the Gospels, the next two quotes. Uh, Jesus and the, the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's in Exodus. That's in the Old Testament, right? A part of the rules from ancient history. <laughs> ancient, ancient history, right? But I tell you, do not resist evil. See, the, mo the moment we start, f the moment we think we got a fight going on here, right? The moment we got a fight, we got a problem. You know, boom, you fight, put the dukes up, you, know, you fight against each other. There's no, there's no need to fight against anything. If anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn to him also the other. Now that seems to be asking for a great deal, but that's really the truth of the matter. There's that if, if you immediately respond to an insult, let's say, with an insult, then you've just amplified the insult. You haven't helped to clarify the situation at all, right? Going on, this is with the, the same, uh, also Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 6, 7 is where the Sermon on the Mount is. And we think that that's probably, that they, those are originally probably sayings of Jesus that people remembered, that, that kept, that they memorized, that kept being repeated over and over and over again, but got put together as one unit and becomes a Sermon on the Mount. But you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. We don't curse them, we don't damn them. We, we, we look to get along with them, that's what we're doing. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. You're children of your Father in heaven by loving them. That's what God, God loves. It, the love is extended to everyone. There's no one who's exempt from God's love. And then the example is, he causes his son to shine on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's why we're all equal, all the same. God has no favorite children. We'll do, I think, one or two more slides, and then we, okay, this is a good friend, Martin Luther King Jr., obviously, saying, if we do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, will we blind and toothless nation? And that's true, you know? I mean, that's just, uh, everything is killed. I think that's okay. That's where I'm going to stop. And the reason for stopping is uh, so we can have some discussion about this. So what's your response to what I've, I've thrown that stuff at you for about 25 minutes now? So just get a little feedback here. So now it's your turn. And especially in light of what's been going on in the news, without talking about anybody. Yes. Oh, you need a mic. And Shanti, you've got, you're responsible for the mic. It's over here, in the back row. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, John. Uh, mic's on, on. Thank you, John. Yeah, good. My question is, how do we, during our silence, and we hear um, direction from God, um, make it manifest based on if we are truly creators like our Father. Thank you. Well, we, we, you do it in terms of the immediacy of, this, of whatever is standing in front of you, right? By, by loving whoever is there, you know, loving our children, loving our spouses, loving the people we work with. I mean, just carrying that with you all the time wherever you are and not, not seeing problems, even when there are problems. You know, that's being able to overlook the problem to the point at which I can continue to, to look for the right response. Never, one of the ways that people will sometimes ask me if I can sort of summarize the course in a few words, and one of the things I, I have four, four three-word sentences that I like the, the, here's the course in four, three word sentences. Number one, do not attack, right? I do not attack this person for whatever, whatever it is. I'm, my response is not to <coughs> attack back. 
Number two, do not defend. Now, I have to be really, really clear when I say do not defend, because what, what I mean is, I don't defend, I don't mean don't defend your body. If your body's attacked, of course, do whatever you can to stop this person from hurting your body for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you wouldn't want to facilitate their error. <laughs> you wouldn't want to make it, you wouldn't want to amplify the error for them. Two, you still believe that you're a body. Proof of that fact is you're hanging out in one. And so as long as you're hanging out in one, you will also believe it could be hurt, so you would want to, to protect it, right? It's the ego that we're not trying to defend, right? Especially if they're if what they're saying isn't true, then why do you want to defend that? And of course, you, there's, I won't get into the whole need for supporting one's reputation in the world if it's a lie. You would say what the truth is, right? All right, I start off with do not judge, then do not attack, do not defend, and then do not hide. Uh, or do not lie, you know, just because we got to let what is true be true. That's the only way that can be part of it. But I do that all the time. I do that in every relationship. Is there some? Yes, uh, you need the mic. Yes. Okay, can you pass up to the front row? It's Linda, right? It's on, I think, Linda. Hello? No, is she shut off? Hello? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, all right. My question is if we could create like God can create because we, we are one with God, then why would we create an illusion of reality? You know, <laughs> that's a very good question. And uh, it's like the question. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's the most typical kind of question in a certain sense. Why would we do something so insane <laughs> as to create a world outside of God? Well, first of all, it never happened. <laughs> I know this is very deep metaphysics. It certainly looks like it happened, though, because, I mean, after all, here we are seeming to be very much uh, alive within the context of this world. It happens, and it goes back to the Adam and Eve story, right? It goes back to the point of separation. It goes back to the point of someone, we'll call him Adam. Adam just means first man. Someone thinking that it's possible to think a thought outside of the mind of God. You can't do it. You can't really think a thought outside of the mind of God. But thinking that you can think a thought outside of the mind of God is the thing which gave rise to this whole delusion, the whole world in, in the first place. And so the Course describes it as an authority problem. You know, somehow we had this, uh, the authority problem is that I can do something without God. And what did I can do without God is that I can think a thought without God. Now, this is really important because the more you study the Course, the more you'll realize that the Course is actually saying you cannot think without thinking in alignment with God. Is that clear? You cannot think without thinking with the mind of God. That's a heavy-duty statement. I mean, that means that you're already enlightened, actually. <laughs> oh, this would, this would be very helpful, yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, oh, use your mic. Hi, I, hello? Oh, okay. I have a story to tell. Um, I was waiting in the Starbucks bathroom and the person didn't come out. And there was a line and they banged at the door and, and the barista, you know, the, you know, and then we hear cursing, like, you know, and, but still there's a line and we're waiting. And she comes out and she pointed, you know, she, at someone else and she pointed a finger at me. I know if I would have moved her hand, she would have slugged me, but I didn't. And um, so she walked away saying, well, next time I'll come out slugging, you know, I'll come out punching. So, you know, where she put that finger in my face, uh -huh. you know, there was still the energy. And I pictured myself, you know, sending, she was obviously, she was homeless. And so I, I pictured sending from where she was putting her finger, uh, right. love right. to her and blessings. Right. And that changed the whole story. Yeah, you know? of course. <laughs> really, you know, it made it a lot better. That's like, that's Jesus saying, you know, pray for your enemies, you know, right? That's all you're doing. You like, bless better. them rather than curse them, right? Because they need to be healed too. You know, this is nothing to react against, right? This is something to be healed, actually. Right? 
Paul, you need to pass the mic down to Paul. I like to read about history. And I think what I'm determined is that this world is never going to work. <laughs> you know, no. It really isn't ever going to work. Right. So if it's never going to work, what happens in the end? What's the conclusion? Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, no, you know it's not. Um, <laughs> uh, there is no end. How can something which never got started stop? <laughs> Enlightenment is a recognition. It's a revelation. It's not a change at all. So all it is is just this recognition, oh, that was a silly dream. Now, I know it looks awfully big, but hey, this is a big universe, and this is just a tiny planet. <laughs> Who knows what's possible within the greater context of the thing, right? It's just understanding it's all an illusion. Very simple. Uh, Linda? So are you saying we could wake up from this dream while we're in this body, or we wake up yes. from this dream? Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure. Okay. Right. I, 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 no, you don't have to die to become enlightened. Okay. Okay. okay, let's make it really clear about that, because it's just, it is just a matter of revelation. So somebody that would, we, would regard, we would regard as an enlightened being is still an embodied being here within the context of the world, but they've got it. They saw it. They, they, they saw the whole thing so completely that they have no need to attack the world anymore. They have no need to find problems in the world. They have no need to put any projections on the world. They have no need to start creating a bunch of laws and doctrines and creeds and principles that people have to live by. There's only one law, and that's, you know, just love, <laughs> the law of love. All right. Uh, Eric. Uh, just without hopefully not making a conflict, I just really beg to differ what you said. I think it's a different time, and um, there's a great future. That's all. What are you saying? Uh, say I that said, again, Eric. It's a different time with a great future. Oh, you mean in terms of our time? In terms of the planet, in terms of the universe, in terms oh, okay. of the all galaxy, right. in terms of everything. All right, so uh, let, me, let me respond. <clears throat> so I agree with you on that and that things are, within the context of the world, changing. Uh, we do see that in terms of the, like the, the passing of the church, because it's actually we're looking for something deeper than rules and regulations and creeds and dogmas and laws, and we're trying to transcend all that. So within, within time, I agree, right? But ultimately, and that's a very important word, ultimately, Ultimately, it's just awakening, and, and, but we got to, what we're in is this pre-awakening stage, if you will, right? And there's still a lot of, there's a line in the Course where it says, the world has yet to experience any comprehensive awakening. Okay. That was 45 years ago. That was 45 years ago, and, but if you look around at the world, it's still, Comprehensive awakening? Oh, there's awakening. I mean, and it's partly it's tied to technology. By technology, I mean just the fact that we can communicate in a, on a level with each other that would never been possible before. And hopefully, because the Course would say that the main principle of the Holy Spirit is communication. That's the communication with the Holy Spirit. But it also means that we can communicate more with each other on a higher level. Which means that we have a chance to raise our, raise our awareness as a whole. As a I whole. totally agree. And, uh, and as far as like what you were saying about murder being more common a thousand less years common. ago. Yeah. Less common now. Right. I don't think it's just because of laws or on account of no. uh, um, the internet or anything like that. I think humanity it's is waking up. Waking up. All, I, all my point that I was making a while ago was, was waking up is hard to do. Waking up is hard. No. <laughs> waking up is hard to do. <laughs> but, we're, we're, that does, but we're still in the process. Totally. That's, what, that's what I mean about, you know, once, you, once, you're, once you've got a certain level of awakening, you can't go back. 
you can't regress. There's a sense in which an awful lot of this world, without making judgments about anybody, are still kind of sleepwalking and kind of walking around within the context of a dream, not realizing that it is a dream. That's not to condemn anyone for anything. It's just to recognize, I think about my folks, they just were the most regular human beings on earth, just regular people wouldn't have, weren't ready for metaphysics yet. Yes. I, I, it's me from Arkansas. I'm here on vacation, and I was coming up the metro on the subway, and there's this, it was probably insurance thing, and it said Project Blue Book. So I saw that, and I wanted to bring it here because we are the awakening. This is the great awakening. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus okay. wanted me to see that. All right. And let's have Jeff, and then let's take our uh, first, uh, let's take our break. Yeah, I totally relate to what you said before about, um, uh, yeah, I've been doing the course for several years, and uh, you realize at one end of the spectrum, there's the ego and then melting into the heart of God, and, uh, you know, being at some point, in between there. And um, I remember um, Ken Wapnick, one of the original t course teachers, was asked by a student, you know, I, I recognize the ego. I don't want to be mired in that. And yet I'm too fearful to melt into the heart of God. What should I do? And his answer was, what can you do? Go back to Brooklyn. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there might be a road trip coming up. So does, does that what he said? The path. Go Thanks. back to Brooklyn? <laughs> he was from Brooklyn, you know. Huh. Okay, let's take our, uh, let's take our break. And We'll be back in uh, 10 minutes.